All right. Thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us. I'm sure that we'll continue to have people signing on, but we have a lot of content to cover, so I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Mike Frost. I'm the product manager for DHS2 Tracker based here at the University of Oslo. Um, and what we wanted to cover and put out into the community is the, the most recent guidance that we have about how to set up large scale tracker instances and handle the analytics associated with it as well. Uh, we're putting this out in the context of the COVID vaccination uh, efforts that have been ongoing, but uh, actually this, this advice could be for anything that hits the kind of large scale that we're seeing. And so we have quite a lot that we'll try to cover. We of course invite you to please put questions forward. We have a thread in the community of practice. Uh, that you can put questions and we will respond to them there. That's a really great place to ask the questions because they'll be preserved for people that will be viewing this uh, later. It is being recorded and we'll post it online to share with others as well. Um, but please do put forward your questions and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to handle them. Depending on how much time we have left after getting through the content, we also can try to handle some of those questions uh, live and talk with, uh, talk with you about them. But I'm just posting the agenda here so you can see the different topics that we're going over. Uh, some of these are, are fairly technical in nature. Um, we really want this information to be passed on uh, to the system administrators. And we, we'd like uh, to get this information out as quickly as we can, because we know many countries are scaling up as we speak in terms of supporting their COVID vaccination implementations. So just to say a little bit about uh, why it is that this is uh, such an important and relevant topic, we have been supporting a number of countries that in 2021 were some of the earliest uh, low and middle income countries to be able to get the COVID vaccine and to try to scale rapidly their individual level systems using Tracker. And that it comes with some significant challenges beyond even what uh, they had been prepared for or been used to. Uh, even if they were DHS2 countries, even if they already had their own teams and uh, servers and ways of running their systems, this uh, was kind of an order of magnitude beyond what uh, they were used to. Um, for a number of reasons, uh, when you're doing uh, this kind of a vaccine, we're, we're seeing that they're capturing entire populations, not a subset of the population. There's often new sites and new users that are involved that are not just the traditional sites, which means that they also are getting new equipment, new hardware. They're setting up new work processes to try to, to really cover uh, such a broad reach of the vaccine programs. And there's also, you know, intense political interest and, you know, health interest in these numbers and wanting to see live numbers and wanting to refresh dashboards all, all the time. Information is being uh, scoured by the news organizations, by the, the political parties in the country. There's, there's just a lot of pressure and intensity of focus on getting this information. And so what we've put together here are our hot to the minute recommendations about ways to configure and run your systems that will allow you to be able to, to scale to the degree that we are seeing as a requirement. Many countries have already started. This is just a quick glance that we have some 40 plus countries that either already have scaled or are starting to uh, using the, the different tools for COVID vaccine programs. And we were able to get some of the numbers from those that have scaled the most to date. Um, and these are numbers that were as of kind of the middle of December, we were seeing uh, Sri Lanka kind of at the top of the list here had over 20 million people at this point enrolled into their system, which was very close to being the entire population. Um, 10 million plus in Rwanda, that's quite a bit more now as well, 7.9 million in Nigeria. And along with those kinds of numbers of, of people being enrolled, you have a dramatically expanded user base in a number of sites. And of course, the data, which we're calling here just the related events, uh, is massive as well. So this is the, the reason that we have uh, come up with these recommendations, the reason that we have the webinar out now. These have been added to our official documentation. And, uh, the link is here in the slide and is shared with you as well in the community of practice. We will be continuing to update these recommendations. So it's important if you're going to be responsible for one of these uh, kind of large scale systems to stay on top of the, the recommendations that are coming out. We'll of course put them out also in the community of practice and through the monthly newsletter. 
And what we are encouraging as much as possible is to take these recommendations from the beginning of your implementation, uh, not waiting until you get into trouble with performance and have the system failing. These systems are meant to be transactional. They're meant to be uh, real time. They're meant to be giving data that is you know, very useful at the moment. And so when they go down, it can have a dramatic impact on uh, the services being provided and on the success of the vaccine program. Again, we're talking about it in the context of COVID vaccines because this is what we expect for 2022 for there to be a lot of scaling. But these same kinds of recommendations would be relevant for your large scale tracker implementations of any kind. So with that as the background, I'm gonna turn uh, over to Bob uh, to talk to us a bit about some of the specific recommendations that we have around server and hosting. So I'll stop sharing my screen, Bob, and let you take over. Very good, so are you seeing a slide that says server and hosting requirements? We see it. Excellent, let me push it full screen quickly. How do I do that? Ah. It's not. Sorry, that's not quite full screen, but it's good enough. Um, okay, so first of all, as I, as people who know me know, I hate I hate being very concrete when people ask me what server requirements are, because it's really, really very much depends on what it is you're trying to do and and um, what the scale of things are. But what I wanted to really emphasize here is that absolutely the most important requirement if you're thinking of hosting a DHIS2 server to do pretty much anything, but particularly to run a very large scale um, vaccination campaign, is you need to have the right level of skill and experience to do it. If you're just, if this is just your initial steps in learning how to install things using the manual, using Linux, then you're probably uh, not the right person to be to be um administering a system is going to be as important as this so in many cases and i would venture to say possibly in most cases you might think of of um strengthening your team uh, in terms of of recruitment probably um if you're not able to do that then you really need to consider perhaps going for a hosted software as a service type solution uh, the other thing that I wanted to raise here, it's not strictly a performance issue, but I don't think it's raised anywhere else, so I'll raise it anyway, is the consequence of, of these very, very large tracker databases, particularly, as Mike was saying, significant proportions of the population, is you are now responsible for a significant amount of personal data. Um, and there are non-trivial security and privacy challenges related to that. So um, I'd say a pretty hard requirement, any organization thinking that they're going to, going to host uh, a DHS2 tracker vaccination server, you need to have at minimum somebody whose role, role it is, whose responsibility is to be responsible for security. You need to have a basic security plan uh, you need to have a plan around around how you're going to manage data privacy. Um, not time to go into the details of what that would look like in this presentation, but um, we will hopefully give some more guidance around that in the near future. Yeah, talking about concrete things, at the end of the day, you do need to get a server of some sort. Um, and what the specifications of that server might be will vary a lot depending on scale. I mean, these numbers were bandied around a little bit earlier in the month. Um, 32 CPUs, 32 gig RAM, SSD fast disk as sort of minimal requirements. I think I can tell you fairly, fairly authoritatively that um, most of those deployments that Mike referred to on the slide, three slides back, like Sri Lanka, for example, they're using considerably more than this. I know the database in Sri Lanka has 128 gigabytes of RAM. For example, that's just the database. 
um, not including the Tomcat and stuff like that. So in general, um, unless you're talking about a very small place, um, these would likely be an underestimate. Um, I talk about one or more virtual machines in the sense that um, for very simple systems, particularly the simple aggregate systems that were um, almost the only kind of DHS2 deployment 10 years ago, the most common thing, you just deploy everything onto one virtual machine. Nowadays, if you want to get more scalability, better security, better performance monitoring and control, um, you're likely going to break this down over a number of virtual machines, not just one. So how big a machine do you need? And I'm not helping you much um, by saying that's too small, probably. Uh, what I'd suggest best way of going about this is think about, well, what, how many tracked entity instances do you have? What's your population size, essentially? How many vaccination sites are you talking about? How many users are you likely to have? And then cross-check against against countries that might have something similar and then find out what it is they have used. Um, in a way, in a sense, that works much better than some kind of rule of thumb. We don't have good rule of thumb calculations. Um, all we have is examples of concrete experience. Something we might try to do is go back through that list again that Mike presented on the earlier slide. We could probably find out and write down what resources are being used in those particular instances. Um, whatever you pick in the end, be prepared to discover that you've got it completely wrong, right? And however much you decided to provision for your virtual machine, it might well be that it's not enough. Um, or it might be that you've done too much and you could save money by making it smaller. The only way of knowing any of that, of course, is by monitoring the performance of your server. And we got, I've got a couple of slides talking a little bit about that shortly. Um, quick word about shared environments, because I mean, as most of you know now, it's quite rare, um, it still happens, but it's quite rare to have fully owned physical hardware um, doing these things. Generally, you're gonna use one or more virtual machines, either from a commercial global provider like Amazon or Linode or Azure or whatever it might be. Or it could be kind of virtual private cloud in a national data center is also quite common. Um, something to bear in mind in all of those, in both of those cases, is that you know when you're talking about high performance and you're looking for guarantees of high performance, you want to try as much as possible to avoid purchasing shared resources. A shared resources basically means that you know, a particular machine might have uh, 64 CPUs and they've sold 48 of them to you and they've also sold 48 of them to somebody else, right? So you don't actually have 48, you're sharing them. Um, and what happens, I've got a couple of graphs I'll show you in a bit. What happens when you've got over-provisioning like that is that um, when your application really wants to work hard, the environment will actually push back against it and throttle it because it doesn't want you to upset the other machines that you're sharing with. Um, so yeah, whether, whether this is with a commercial provider or whether it's something you're getting out of your national data center, um, you want to as much as possible have guarantees about the underlying dedicated resources, not simply um, shared virtual CPUs and things that you've been given. Um, this is something I'm not sure how true it is. I think it actually is. If you are buying buying something off a commercial cloud, generally speaking, it's a good idea to buy as big as possible because the bigger you buy, the less chance you're going to be sharing with others. Um, and then it's possible to containerize within that. Um, if you're working with a local data center, often this might be within ministry or it could be, in many cases, a national data center providing um, enterprise level services to government. Usually they're using VMware in the back end. Um, often they're gonna sell you stuff um, which is very much over provisioned. You've got to be able to test it and be able to get back with evidence to your provider and say, look, you're telling me I've got this SSD disk, but I can see very clearly that it's not performing like an SSD disk. Again, if you don't have good monitoring in place, you're not able to go and make those arguments. 
Okay, versions. This is a this is a slide that's designed to be out of date almost as soon as it's written. Uh, what's important here, I guess, is not the actual versions. What we're saying is at the current moment in time, what we know you should be using JDK 11 for anything that's over version 235 or above. Used to be you were stuck with using JDK 8. Now you can and you should be using 11. Postgres versions, people get, they get different reports of which performs best between 12 or 13. I think it depends a little bit on the kind of loads. There are some things work better in 13 than work better in, others work better in 12. But those are the two most tested versions currently. And definitely uh, you need to be on version 235 or above. Um, and not just that, but you need to be on the latest patch release of it. Um, the important thing about that is probably the last point I've got there is you need to have a well-rehearsed plan for testing and deploying new patch releases rapidly. Because particularly in this area that we found ourselves in in the past year, where Tracker is suddenly being used for a scale that's never really been used before, we've been discovering quite frequently you know, little areas of optimizations and improvements, and often big improvements. Um, but when those improvements come out, you want to be able to take advantage of them quickly. So sometimes they're performance related, and sometimes they can be security related. And these we need to take very seriously. If there are, if there are security vulnerabilities found in in the software, our security team is generally very good at releasing um, mitigations or fixes for those pretty quickly. Um, implementations are not necessarily always very quick to um, deploy them. So yeah, have a plan for testing and deploying the patch releases. If you if you don't have anything better to do while you're waiting for a new patch, then practice so that you know how long it takes. Very important with deploying a patch that you've got an idea um, of how much downtime, for example, you might need to schedule. Okay, that's about all I've got to say in the moment about about actual um, server requirements. I want to talk a little bit more, as I promised, about about this question of monitoring, and particularly performance monitoring, um, and the kind of thing things, the kind of questions you need to be able to answer when you're running a complicated mixture of services um, is first of all, as we've referred to earlier, do I have enough resources? Or maybe a, do I have too much? If I've just done something to improve matters, <coughs> did it make a difference? Did it work? How much did it work by? If I know that users are reporting in the field that something is slow, um, can I say what is slow? You know, what part of the system is struggling? Is it coming from the Tom case? Uh, very often, if you don't have any kind of monitoring in place, um, what you get is very, very vague answers to these kind of questions. Right? People will simply say, oh, my system performing badly, or it keeps crashing, or it's so slow. Um, and it can be very, very hard to, to pinpoint where you need to make an intervention and how successful your intervention is being, or whether you've provisioned stuff the way you should. Um, you can't know the answer to any of these questions without measuring um, and running a large tracker server without having good metrics on it. I say it's like driving around in the dark with the lights off. So there are obviously many, many ways of measuring. There's, there's simple tools on the command line that people might be familiar with. Um, here, I'm not talking so much about them. There's quite a lot you can do with simple tools. Um, I'm talking more about the kind of software that's going to record and display historical data about different aspects of your system to give you a good overall picture of what's happening and what's been happening over time. Um, kind of popular combinations, Prometheus and Grafana, many of you might hear about. It's very popular, certainly in very large deployments. The Elk stack is something similar, net data. Two pieces of Two pieces of software that I'm going to show you here that are less complex really to set up than those, but which um, we have found in quite a lot of large installations have been very useful for understanding answers to some of the questions that I posed in the previous slide. 
So, for example, this is this is a this is a graph from Moonin, which tells you what your CPU has been doing over the last 24 hours or so. Um, and it's very clear immediately when you look at that graph, when you get used to looking at these things, there's all this red stuff on the top, this red and purple stuff, which spells something abnormal is going on. Right. And we're hoping we're going to we're going to put together a session at some point about um, um, what's the word interpreting some of these phenomena that you see. But in this case, what you can say, looking at that red stuff is what's called steel time. It basically means that your your host on which your virtual machine is running is throttling your CPU. And so you're trying to use your 40 CPUs that you have. As you start to use anything more than 20, it starts to push back at you. The purple stuff is even more scary. When you see that purple stuff, you see here, IO wait. It means that your CPU, instead of actually doing any useful work, is busy waiting on the disk. That can be really important information to know because we just said earlier that we need to have a fast disk. If your CPU is waiting on the disk, it means your disk is not fast enough for you. Um, these kind of graphs, again, from Moon and actually show you that sort of thing as well very quickly. Look at a graph like this, and you can see that our main disk has got 100% utilization. It's busy 100% of the time. Right? I'm not going to get any more performance out of it. So this is telling me I probably need a better disk. Um, yeah, it's just another example of... This is a server that it was running pretty fine all week and then something very weird happened on Saturday. The nice thing about having a graph like this is you can see that something happened. If you didn't have any kind of graph, all you might know is that users on Saturday afternoon started saying that something is slow, right? What actually happened here, if I recall correctly, is some long running Postgres query, which uh, blocked some other transactions and caused your database to get choked up. Um, but again, having that insight into it is really important. Those were just a couple of examples from Moonin. And um, the other piece of software I've mentioned and something that's proved really useful for most of our big implementations is this thing called Glowroot, which is actually a uh, it's like a web-based Java, uh, Java profiler. But again, allows you to get quite detailed and useful information really quickly. So you just open up the, the, the page here. And at first glance, the first thing you notice is that 41% of the time is being used on this particular API call. So immediately, you know, you know if this server is going to be optimized at all, probably you want to start looking at the thing that's using 41%, right, rather than going off trying to make other things faster, which are not really being used very much. Uh, some other example. Here's an example. These are the kind of graphs that you love to see. What you're seeing here is the response times uh, for, I can't remember what request this was, but this is basically taking 20 seconds on average here to 30 seconds. And then we managed to deploy a fix, right? a new war file, which addressed a performance uh, optimization. And you can see from about 8.45 there, suddenly pieces descended on the land, right? And we're getting much, much better performance. So, yeah, having these kind of tools is, it's kind of invaluable. It's very hard to get your system performing well and know, knowing that it's performing well without any kind of optics like this. Okay, just one last slide from me. It's just really a summary, I guess. Um, going to scale and going with like complex systems like this, it requires monitoring. This is not a this is not an optional add-on. You need to be able to do it. You've got choices over what tools to use, but um, importantly, you need to know when you're in trouble and when you are in trouble. You need to know where the pain is coming from. Um, you need to be able to see if you make a change whether that change has worked or not. And this is really important. You need to be able to report useful evidence to back to developers to say, look, there's something not right. Um, and here we can show you exactly what is not right. We're not just saying this thing is slow. Um, similarly, if you need to be able to complain to your hosting provider to say your disk is slow, it's useful to be able to give them some graphs to show them that the disk really is slow. Um, on the point of 
of involving developers and technical assistance and support, maybe from the global team or even from, from others. Um, very often it's not possible or legal or appropriate or even a good idea to give outsiders access to your national database. Um, it's just simply, it's not usually the right thing to do. But it can be a very useful thing to do um, and a very simple thing to do to give access to your monitoring system. So that if you know you're having a problem, you want to get some outside report, one of the support, one of the things we know has been very effective is by saying, all right, I've got Glowroot running in here. Um, would you mind logging into my glow root and having a look and seeing if you can help us interpret what the trouble is so it's actually a real good way of getting technical support to have web-based monitoring systems in place all right sorry that was a bit rushed but that is it from me i'll look in the chat for questions and things and try and answer as we go along Scott, are you just going to steal this from me, or do I have to give it? Oh, I've just taken it from you, Bob. Very good. <laughs> right. All right. Well, um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Scott Westpatrick. I'm the DHS2 Analytics Product Manager here at the University of Oslo. And I am now going to take us through uh, a bit of the analytics problems and some of the solutions that we are seeing with these very large-scale tracker programs, specifically around COVAX. So... What are the actual problems? You know, I think probably many of you have unfortunately run into this, but we are seeing some slow performing dashboards or maybe even dashboards that never load at all. We see line lists, tables, different types of charts, analytics that also take a long time to load or do not load. We see sometimes the analytics tables are failing uh, when, you, when you try to kick those off. And in a very worst case scenario, and this happens rarely, very, very rarely, we see that the servers can crash because of overloaded analytics queries. Again, very uncommon, but it has happened. Um, so we're, we're trying to be transparent and honest about it. It has, it is, uh, it, it, um, it's, uh, it's a possibility. So what causes these? Probably more important to understand, very large scale tracker implementations with inadequate server specs or expertise. Just as Bob was pointing out, that's the most typical cause of these analytics issues is you're trying to run these very large analytics for these very large tracker programs on underpowered server infrastructure. Um, and as Bob pointed out, it's extremely important to be able to monitor this and to address it. The other principal cause is very heavy analytics requests. So for example, in DHIS2, you can make a map quite easily that will show you every single tracked entity in the country if you have them geolocated, right? So I can turn on, and if you're Sri Lanka, 20,000 tracked entities on the same map. Obviously, that is a massive request to the server to pull up that kind of information on a map. And it's going to take time. It's going to be very slow to load, if it loads at all. The other one are, we're we see a lot of use of the event reports application to produce line lists of tracked entities, patients or events um, uh, for COVAX and for tracker in general, obviously. And so any event report line list that's over a hundred rows for events or over 50 rows for enrollments is gonna be a heavy analytics request. Another one is visualizations. So any type of chart or pivot table that is looking at a very long period of data, right? So if you're going past 12 months or so of data and you're trying to pull up data for maybe you're an entire uh, COVAX program in which you have tens of millions of people enrolled in, that's a lot of data to pull out and produce in the analytics. So we're seeing issues there as well. And the biggest culprit if we can point our finger at one particular thing is specifically enrollment type program indicators. Um, for example, if we're being COVAX specific, we're really talking here about some indicators such as dropout rates. And actually these analytics that you see here on the screen on the other side are looking at the various COVAX um, uh, indicators as they were initially defined with, um, through, with, with WHO in DHIS2. And we see that the COVID, or sorry, the dropout indicators 
are by far the least performant indicators. They are taking the longest to produce those, those values. The reason is, is because those dropout indicators were originally defined as enrollment type and where they're processing all tracked entities in the COVAX program, looking at basically all the events in the COVAX program and trying to identify very specific number of them. It's a very heavy, it's a very heavy calculation. It's looking at a lot of data. It's a lot of things to calculate on the fly for, for analytics. And you see the other types of indicators that were specific for COVAX are significantly better performing. The same thing goes with the chart on the bottom. The chart on the bottom is illustrating that when you have, when you're querying analytics for a long period, so again, like up to 12 months, you're once again, asking for a lot of data. And all of this is being calculated on the fly in DHIS2. So these program indicators are just happening in real time. So when you, when you click update on your chart, it's going to start processing the data to produce the value for you. We know if you put more data in there, it takes longer to process. Um, and so that's what this chart is illustrating is by adding more periods, longer durations, you're, you're producing more, you're putting more data into the calculation. So let's talk about some solutions now. The very first solution, principally and foremost, is to make sure that you have adequate resources and support for your servers, as Bob was mentioning. You know, in the links that we, we provided, one of those links is to a guidelines that we, that we produce to help with tracker performance. Uh, specifically for analytics. And in those guidelines, we have a, uh, a server checklist, as Bob was mentioning as well, that you need to go through and make sure that you've ticked all those boxes and yet you are able to respond to that entire checklist. That's probably going to help with your analytics issues. A couple of other things that are more controllable, specifically on the DHIS2 side. The first one is do not run your analytics tables during high usage periods throughout the day. So do not run your analytics table, say at noon or in the afternoon, when you have a lot of users going and entering data for uh, COVAX or any other type of tracker program that you're, that you're monitoring that you have in your DHIS2 instance. If there's a lot of traffic on the data entry side, that means more server, more server resources are being used up there. And then when you try to run your analytics tables, which is very intensive on the server resources, then you're just going to start competing with yourself, essentially, right? it's not gonna be a good situation. You need to make sure that you're running your analytics tables at low usage periods. Typically, we see this as best practice as in the middle of the night or in the very early morning um, before, before a lot of users have logged in on the day and gotten work started. The other one is please use event type program indicators as much as you possibly can. So things like, um, and, and, and Rebecca, later in the presentation, is going to talk a little bit about how we've updated our COVAX packages to be more dependent on event type program indicators. But we do see that these are more performant. They have, by the nature of them, they are processing a small amount of data or making fewer connections um, and, and, have, uh, and, and typically result in uh, better performing analytics and, and on the fly calculations. Again, enrollment type, indicators can be very resource intensive and slow for these very large track programs. The other one is, um, and this is a, a best practice that has actually emerged from the countries that we've been supporting through this, is do not have uh, dashboards with program indicator based analytics as the default landing page after login. So of course you all log into DHIS2, the first thing you see is a dashboard. Right. Even if you're not using that dashboard, even if you just go straight from that dashboard to data entry or the capture app or some somewhere else, you have sent those analytics requests. DHIS2 is trying to load that dashboard for you. And what that means is every single person that's doing that, there's not even paying attention to that dashboard, is consuming server resources um, just by the nature of that landing page being there. So what do we advise as best practice is to set a informational dashboard as the landing page that has that's primarily populated with things like text items or hyperlinks. Here you see an example from Sri Lanka where this is their landing dashboard for their COVAX instance. And you can see that it's just a couple of text boxes, some useful information to the user, right? 
this is a very low intense in terms of resources dashboard to load. This will load very quickly every time, regardless of how many times that you look at it. It's not, it's not doing any calculations. It's not pulling any data. It's just displaying some text. Um, and you can do this very easily by making like the dashboard name like asterisk, asterisk notice. And what that will do is by putting those asterisks in there, it will put the dashboard to the front of their saved of your dashboard list as you see kind of here in the Sri Lanka example. So this is best practice now. Um, and in fact, in 238, we have a feature coming out that will allow you to set this as default essentially for DHIS2. But if you're using, as you, you know, you're using DHIS2 today, you're using up to 237, you have to configure this dashboard yourself, but it's quite simple. Um, and, and I highly, highly encourage everyone to do this. Some additional solutions. We have, we make the recommendation for these very large scale tracker programs to limit the sharing of the dashboard with, with large program indicators, especially enrollment type program indicators to only those users that really need to see the information. Not just anyone and everyone who could be curious about it, but those users that you know are going to make critical decisions based upon that data. Um, the reason is, is because the fewer users that are hitting these dashboards, uh, the, the less requests that we are sending to the server, the more performant your DHIS2 is going to be generally. Um, you can do this in two ways. You know, you can limit the requests in terms of the just the users um, that can see it, but you can also restrict the organizational units that that dashboard is showing, right? So if a district health officer only needs to be concerned for their job about their vaccination numbers, then only show them their own district. You know, you don't need to show them the entire country. Obviously, showing data for the entire country is a lot more data to include into the calculations again, more taxing. Uh, restricting the org units is, is easily done by selecting relative org unit assignments to that user for the analytics that you put onto the dashboard. Another couple of things is make sure if you are able to, well, if you can, is to try to view these dashboards or set up your routine data use meetings, your, your various decision planning events, outside of peak hours for the vaccination itself, right? So if you know that vaccination is mainly happening in the morning, set your planning meetings in the afternoon uh, or vice versa um, as, as best you can to make sure that those who folks who are, who are using DHIS2 to enter data are not going to potentially be disturbed by your very heavy analytics requests that you'll be sending to produce these, to produce these dashboards. All right, moving on. A couple of technical points here on caching. So what we recommend is for caching is to make sure that your DHIS config analytics caching expiration is set to at least 3,600. This is in the time frame about six to 10 hours. And in the system settings app to make sure that your caching strategy is set to at least cache at 6 a.m. tomorrow. And you need to set your cacheability to private to, to, um, to avoid um, um, some additional issues. What does this mean? This essentially means that when a user logs on and looks at the dashboard, that dashboard will load once and then it will be cached into their web browser. So that when they go away from that dashboard and then come back, it will use what's already cached in the web browser instead of pinging the server and hitting the server and pulling all of that data again. This is more performant for the user. So that means that they are only waiting to load the dashboard really once or waiting for that, that data to be populated one time from the server. And then every time they go back to it, it's just updating with any new information as opposed to pulling all the data that's associated. Uh, and so this is definitely best case practice. And we've seen in quite a number of countries, they don't have this caching strategy set. It's extremely important uh, and it will limit the amount of traffic and, and, and can improve the performance of your servers. The other one, the last request here for this slide, and this is a hard recommendation to make because we know how popular this particular feature is, but we recommend for these very large scale tracker instances to turn off your continuous analytics. Continuous analytics is a feature that, that was released in I believe 235 or 236. 
um, that updates in real time your analytics as new data comes in, essentially. The problem with continuous analytics is it is not, it, 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 it essentially has been shown to, for these very large scale tracker programs to form a bit of a bottleneck. It's not as performant as we would like. Um, we are of course working on the core software to improve its performance. But as it stands right now, if you're using you know, DHIS2 today, then you, it's recommended that you turn it off for these large scale tracker uh, deployments. Um, if you're using aggregate data, it's fine. It, it, you, know, you can go as big scale as you want with aggregate data for continuous analytics, but for the tracker data, um, for these kinds of program indicators, it, we recommend that you do not use continuous analytics. Um, and, and again, we are working on trying to improve it in the, in the core product, but it, you know, it is, uh, it's a complicated thing. It will take a bit of time. Then I want to make just a couple of last resort solutions. So we're, I'm going to make these recommendations under the pretense that you've already gone through the server checklist. You've done everything you can to make your, your server resources are there. You've gone through all of the other recommendations that I made for analytics. Those have not improved the situation. So these are last resort options for you. The first one is to remove tracker analytics access for all non-critical users. What does that mean? That means that if they don't have a job where they need to view tracker data, critically important for their job, then you can remove the access for them to see tracker data entirely. Not ideal, but it means that you have a lot less users actually hitting the server trying to access the data and, and pull those analytics. The next point here is that you can be a bit more creative about, about this. If you have the technical skills available to you, you can make things like SQL views, HTML reports, R Shiny apps that will be able to produce these indicators, these very heavy indicators um, uh, for you a bit more performantly than the standard DHIS2 analytics will. Uh, and so this is, an op this is a, a, a path that we're starting to explore now a little bit more seriously. We have a team working on trying to establish some of these standard SQL views. We have a team that's exploring some R Shiny app options. Um, and hopefully we're coming out with more updated, improved guidance specifically to this point. But, um, but there are a lot of expertise out there, as, you know, looking at the folks on the call here, there's a lot of folks who have the technical ability to produce these SQL views or uh, other ways in which you're able to pull the data, um, the specific indicators that you want out of DHIS2 to, to, to view them in a more performant way. The next one is, um, this one is brand new suggestion. We have not fully vetted this one yet. Uh, this is something that we've just started to explore, but it looks like it could be promising. So I'm going to put it out there. I put it out there with the, with the disclaimer that if you don't have the technical expertise available to you, to you specifically the server um, um, resources, the, the server, the expert server uh, managers, do not consider this. But you can, if you have those, you can consider setting up a separate DHIS2 instance on a separate server that will routinely pull the, um, the data that is being captured in your production instance. And you use that separate instance just to produce your analytics. We have seen some fairly dramatic performance improvements if you have a dedicated server to your just your analytics. Um, and, uh, and so that may be a possibility for you if you have the technical expertise to be able to do it. It's not something you just wanna play around with. The last resort here is to, and this is, this is a very, very much a last resort, is you can set your default landing application for all users to something that's not analytics. For example, data entry or the capture app maybe. Um, and that will essentially mean that if a user wants to see data in DHIS2 in the analytics, they have to physically you know, click over to it. Um, and, and that will limit the traffic that's going on in analytics as well. Okay, and again, I just wanna make sure that we understand the context that all of these recommendations are for very large scale tracker programs. This is not DHIS2 generally. DHIS2 generally analytics performed quite well. 
Uh, this is just when you have these massive large scale tracker programs that Mike was, was, uh, was, was making reference to earlier. The last point to make here is please do not suffer in silence. Um, later in the presentation, Olaf will give you some guidance on how you can actually communicate with us. But when you run into these problems, please do tell us about it so that we can help catalog it. We can help, we can potentially work with you to help under, uh, understand the issue and maybe find a solution. More importantly than that even is, there's a lot of folks out there who are working on addressing these shared issues. Um, and we really want to hear about the solutions that you have. A lot of the recommendations that I've given you already were uh, discovered essentially by uh, various countries and DHIS2 implementers that, that had you know, addressed the situation by some of these recommendations already. Um, and so we've collected those here. We're presenting them to you now. This is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of folks out there who are coming up with other solutions and innovations in this in this respect. And it's important that you share those with us so that we all can benefit from them. We're a global uh, community. It takes a global effort to, to tackle these kinds of uh, big programs. So with that, I will hand it off to Marcus to uh, take us through the tracker. So over to you, Marcus. Thanks, uh, thanks Scott. Uh, just you see my screen, um, uh, so I'll just uh, just go ahead. Um, when uh, when one of these big tracker implementations uh, starts struggling um, and goes down, or otherwise becomes um, hard to use um, and usable, um, then that's often uh, that's always a product of many things compounding. Uh, and um, uh, when we get involved, um, it's uh, it's all too often uh, already trouble. Uh, there's uh, usually a um, server that uh, is completely overloaded, and and we um, we are trying to help um, in in many cases. And the first things we do uh, might be in, uh, to make sure that, that uh, there are monitoring, so we can get some visibility to the server. So I just want to reiterate that we we do need monitoring to to help you, um, and um, uh, when um, when we work on a problem with a country, we often try many things at once. Uh, we will work on the server. We will look at the hardware. We will look at um, reducing the stress from analytics, um, and we will look at uh, making changes to the program. Uh, to alleviate some of the pressure and uh, make sure that we have the most performance system we can. So um, what I will do is to go through six of these uh, learnings that we have made um, from uh, real world, very high pressure situations. Um, we have uh, these six uh, learnings that um, that has uh, helped greatly in in um, many use cases and should be considered for all uh, all, all high level um, high high volume tracker uh, implementations. Uh, it might not be that you can implement all of them uh, or should implement all of them for various reasons, but you should consider all of them. They are all in the document that was shared at the very beginning and. This is again a strong recommendation to go and look at that document. It's very short and concise and contains valuable information, hard earned information. So um, the first, first um, issue slash solution I will uh, look at with you is the ID generation. And this is um, something we have discovered that is that the um, random pattern, uh, if you're generating IDs using the gesture and using the random pattern, this is very heavy. Um, we recommend that anyone using the random pattern uh, migrate to a sequential pattern. Uh, if you're going to migrate pattern, it, uh, it's um, important to have a plan for uh, making sure that your IDs will not overlap with your new pattern. So in my example here, we have simply added a prefix of A so that uh, your new ID pattern would um, be prefixed in some way if, uh, if, if it's generated with the new, uh, new strategy of sequential. Um, we um, uh, would also want to mention that um, earlier this year, the sequential was also very, very slow. 
but we have greatly improved the um, performance of the sequential generated uh, patterns. Um, so one thing to reiterate from Bob's presentation is that you should keep up to date with the latest point version. If you're not able to use the later or latest point version, then sequential will also be a problem. You should also upgrade this, uh, this uh, point version. The next um, recommendation uh, learning I'll uh, go through is the, um, that the standard working lists in the tracker programs are generally heavy. Uh, if we have a closer look here with our magnifying glass, um, the default list, if you open any tracker program, is the any enrollment status list. So this is a, essentially all enrollments in that program um, in, in your list. Uh, of course, it's paged, but still, uh, this might not be a, a list that is very useful uh, for the clinician or whoever is working on records. Um, they will. Uh, you should really ask yourself whether this list will bring any value to the users. Um, one first aid um, measurement that you can make if your server is uh, struggling or if you realize this list is not useful is to simply turn it off. And that's done in the, in the tracker um, uh, maintenance um, and it's called display front page list. So if you turn this off, then um, it will look like yeah, this. Uh, a user opening the child program will see the search form directly and would have to search for the record before working on it. Uh, one downside is that if you turn off the front page list, this will also be disabled in Android, which might not be desirable in all, in all cases. So this is something to keep an eye on if you turn the list off completely. Um, if you don't want to turn it off completely, then building targeted lists is, um, is the recommendation. Uh, make targeted working lists that contains the um, relevant tracked instances for the use cases that uh, your users will see in their day-to-day -day work. Make useful shorter lists. This is a screenshot from the Norwegian, uh, uh, Norwegian COVID instance. Uh, and um, uh, to help a little bit with the translation the, and, and show some examples of, of uh, this instance, um, the first list here is the indexes due for follow-up today. So this is a very central part of anyone working with COVID um, uh, tracing in Norway. Um, the other one is the, where, um, the list of notifications not sent. So this is a specific work task that someone might, uh, might have on the team. Um, we have another one for the uh, assigned tasks, which um, is the COVID cases with an assignment to the current user and another for the unassigned tasks. As you can see there, there are others, but these are examples of um, lists that are short, short uh, and serve specific uh, use cases. My next um, slide here is on database indexes because we know that searching, um, when you use non-unique tracked entry attributes, searching is heavy. Um, text comparisons are heavy and um, uh, if you look at the search form for the child program, the, um, the top uh, unique ID is fast. So any, any attributes that can be unique, it's a really big advantage if they are unique. Um, the uh, the um, uh, non-unique items like last name and first name is um, uh, much heavier and you should add these uh, B3 indexes for these attributes. Um, this is um, very um, concisely described in the uh, document linked uh, as well. Um, even with the SQL to add these indexes, um, they are fairly quick to add and they have a very big effect. Um, these indexes should be added on the most, uh, most used um, searched uh, tracked attributes, tracked entity attributes. Um, another um, uh, small mitigation that can be done is that we see very broad searches sometimes. And this is a bit of a bad habit on the user's part. If they uh, try a very broad search, like putting the uh, first name A and, and click search, um, this will produce a very long list of results, not, not useful and also heavy to load. Um, so 
um, we recommend that you make sure to have a look at um, a setting called maximum number of tracked entry attributes, tracked entry instances to return in search um, under the um, under the program details in maintenance. Um, and set this number to something sensible, like for example, 10. Um, this would, um, would produce a user experience where the user would, uh, if, if they search too broadly with more than 10 results, they would see a, um, a dialogue like this, uh, telling them to be more specific in their search. Um, this uh, maximum number of uh, tracked entity instances to return should be set both for the program and for the tracked entity type. Um, and it's um, easy to do and, and um, effective to avoid this uh, bad uh, pattern from, from users searching too broadly. Uh, my last um, point to, to bring up is the, um, uh, the blessing and the curse of the API, uh, custom API queries. In some cases, the custom scripts and apps and, and integration middleware is exactly what you need to make sure that you have a targeted use of your power and make sure that, that um, uh, you do everything in the most efficient way possible. Um, what we see sometimes though is that um, these custom scripts are also an, an extra um, there's extra risk um, for these uh, custom scripts to be to be uh, heavy and inefficient um, this might be partially because the uh, uh, the scripts are less tested we have by now um, good procedures for doing performance testing we have battle tested the apps uh, we have fixed many of the inefficient queries that is done by the tracker capture and capture apps, for example, and by the dashboards. Um, but when someone makes a new query, it might not be as well tested. Uh, some pitfalls that um, we have seen um, uh, can have a big impact is the skip paging. Uh, it's tempting to turn off the paging because then it's easier to program, um, but uh, it will be a high load on the server if you turn off paging. Um, if you use the page count parameter, this is uh, effectively, even if you use paging, they still have to count all the records in the database to determine the number of pages. So this is also something to avoid. Um, we have seen that uh, when you compare tracked entry uh, attribute uh, values um, in the API um, and use like instead of equals, uh, like is much more heavy and you should always use equals if you can. Uh, so this is another, another pitfall to mention. Um, for um, the actual um, mitigation of this though, uh, what we can say is that check for pitfalls. That's the first thing. Make sure that when you make an API query, look for problems and look for um, uh, look for the most efficient way to, to make these queries. Um, but you really need to monitor your system to see if there is any problem, problems um, in, the, in your live system coming from, uh, from one of the custom queries. Uh, so have monitoring it in place and keep an extra eye on, on custom queries. Um, that was my last slide. So I will hand it over to Jaime on the Android team. I may, uh, you're muted. Oh, shit, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? I'll take yes, it. Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much, Marcus. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jaime, part of the Android team. And we are aware of many of the implementations of COVID, COVAC are using Android devices. So during this set of slides, I'm going to cover some considerations that we think, we believe you should be taking into account because they might uh, really improve or degrade the performance of your server. This is a checklist of the things I'm gonna be covering and by the end of, the, of my slides, what I would like you to do when you do the analysis on your system is to be able to check them all. So very quick introduction of what I'm gonna be talking about. 
Um, basically, what I would like you to remember when you do this assessment is that Android devices are going to behave like this four-sided uh, health worker that is going on the field and decides to take everything with them because they don't know what they will need when doing the, the work. This means taking all the papers that may need. This means taking all the labels that might need to attach to these forms, all the equipment, et cetera, et cetera. This is the key concept to remember because Android is gonna behave on that way. Android will download, when I say Android is the application, Android, the device, whatever, I'm gonna be using these terms the same way. Uh, Android is gonna download as much as it might need, and the key concept is might need here, uh, just to be able to perform the work when they go offline. Uh, going back to this similarity with the worker going on the field, they will not know, they could not know if they will be doing, uh, taking care of 10 patients, 100 patients, 1,000 patients, they will not know what they will need, so they will take everything with them. So Android is going to be um, working on the same way. And this is a concept that applies to many of the things I'm gonna be telling now. So in terms of user accesses or access, one of the things we really recommend is that you have different users for probably using web or using Android. And ideally you should have even different users for different uh, organizations units or where people or these health workers are going to. Examples uh, can be fine in the document that was listed uh, at the beginning. But basically, if you have one person, one worker who's going to go uh, to that specific hospital or to that specific health post, you want to limit the amount of information that will be downloaded. So try to target and uh, minimize the numbers of organization units, programs, and data sets you are assigning this user. Because again, going back to my explanation at the beginning, Android on the synchronization is going to say, it's going to tell the server, give me all the information or the data or the things that I might need to perform my work. So we'll take us all these things. So reducing can have a huge impact in the server. Again, think that this is one device, but the moment you start having many more devices, hundreds or thousands of devices, these requests are multiplied for this. So the server has to perform all these kind of uh, process. Here I'm having, well, in all of the slides, you will see on the bottom here some links that will take you to recommendations that I'm explaining. And you can read them afterwards if you need to. Uh, another thing is having the auto-generated values that is very common. Uh, Marcus has already covered in terms of random and the sequential, so I will not be covering that. But what I want you to remember is a bit the same. With Android, you will be downloading many things from the server. And this means that if you're using reserve values because you're using a unique ID, unique IDs or things like this, you will be having um, them downloaded with Android. So every time the Android checks the server, connects to the server, it will say, okay, I'm going offline give me a hundred values by default. So it will take all these values and this multiplies again for several devices. Uh, so you need to adjust this in the official documentation and in the post you will have some information that can give you some examples. But another thing I want to mention here is that it's important that you understand how Android works in terms of using dates. Uh, today is the 20th, January the 21st. So if you're using dates and these dates in your uh, generative values include the month, Android will download 100 uh, generative values for this month, which is January, and will be able to use them until February, of course, because on February they will be marked as expired. So in terms of knowing how your implementation works, if these uh, health workers are going on the field for long periods of offline or they're gonna be completely online the whole time, can play a different role. For example, if today would not be the 21st of January, but the 31st, so 10 days from now, and you download 100 values or 1,000 values because you think your, your workers will be going out on the field without connectivity for a long time, 
the next day, so February the 1st, all these values will be marked as ex expired. So the Android application will not be able to process it and will need to request more of these values to the server. Again, multiply this for several devices, but having the same problem over and over again. So in terms of using this kind of dates, uh, there is some information on this post, but I would say that the worst case scenario in case you're working offline, could be using days, then could be using months, and then it could be using years in case you're using this for generative values. This applies for offline because if you're working online the whole time, well, you will be overloading the server every time you, you ask for these values, but at least you can use these values while being offline. For sequential, I will not make any mention. I think Andrew, uh, Marcus covered that pretty well before. And random, depending on the version, you might be having a huge impact in the performance by using one of those. So what I've been telling you about is like how Android behaves, but the good thing is that you could install this application on your server, which is called the Android Sending Web App, that is gonna allow you to tweak these little things I've been telling you about, the amount of values you want to download or for specific users, for specific programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as well as adapt the metadata and data sync process. Well, all this. I will not cover this because I don't think we will have much time, but basically uh, you have here a uh, very well documented everything. And in the document from the beginning, we have covered some examples. It's very difficult for us to understand all the implementations, but we have given examples saying, we think if you are having, if you're working in an online environment with this and this, probably you want to set this to this and this and this. Again, the good thing of this application is that one of the last things it includes in the menu is testing for a specific user. So if you could put the user there and you perform the simulation, you could see how much data that user would be downloading and can help you understand if it's a very heavy process or not. I think I have a couple more slides. One is not, well, this is about mobile device management. It's something we have been recommending for a while. There is a whole guideline that covers this. Um, but basically, I we wanted to put it here because despite not impacting directly the performance somehow, it's important to, to know how it works and how can it help you. A mobile device management basically is a tool that you can use to manage your devices so not many implementations have them have it at the moment, but it could help you if in one of these points on several others, but let's focus on these ones. Basically, one of the things we have seen that happens and usually comes with Prom is that we from Oslo release a new version of the application. And because we're publishing this on Google Play, uh, your devices will auto update probably, and then you have not properly tested, and maybe the new application is not working properly, or it includes some things that you were not tested, you were not be, you were not able to test, or you could not train your users on them. So somehow it might impact the performance. That's the reason we're putting it here. And with this mobile device management, you can control the version uh, of the app you are deploying to your devices. Another thing that is not really in terms of performance, but might impact as well, is that you should be, with this MDM, you can locate and, and track those devices. You can remotely wipe them, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, and for example, you could also limit uh, in case you see that many, sorry, I'm gonna roll back. Imagine you have an implementation with thousands of devices and all these devices are reaching or hitting your server at the same time. Pop up at the beginning was, since, was showing some graphs. So imagine you're seeing these graphs always happening like uh, in the night, whatever. This means that all your devices are synchronizing during the night. So with the MDM, you could be playing with this and you could escalate and say, okay, the devices from one to 100 will be pushing information to the server at this time. Uh, the 400 to 200 on Tuesdays and things like this. So you could balance a bit with this, this thing. However, we are aware that this usually is a costly uh, solution and not many implementations can take advantage of it. 
But if you cannot do this, at least one of the things we think you should do is to disable the auto updates of your DHIS2 Android application. By default, most of the Google Android devices will have this option enabled. So when you install an application, in this case, the DHIS2 application, it's going to come with auto update. This means what I was telling you before, we from Mosdo publish a new version of the app and all your devices will uh, download, update their, their application. This might have an impact on your implementation because you are not, uh, you have not had the time to test this, or you, it might be that it comes with a bug, unfortunately, and it impacts uh, how your devices are performing, et cetera, et cetera, and also escalates to the server. So having this to disable, it's a good recommendation. So you have the time to test it before. And then once you have tested that your application, the new version of the application is working well with your setup, you can tell your users, please, it's time to update. So you can go here to the application, you can open the Play Store and click update, and that's it. Usually, if you have disabled this auto update, it remains through the process of update. So with the new version, you will not have to do it. So we are aware that many implementations uh, have users that they're using their own devices and you don't have control of this, but it's good that maybe when you, if in case you have uh, manuals on how to install application, you include this little thing here saying, once you have installed the application, make sure you have disabled the update dates. And yes, this is the summary of the things I've been talking about. Uh, what I was saying before, if you try to remember that Android is going to behave as this foresighted user that will download everything before going on the field, please have in mind with you the analysis and then come back to this checklist and say, okay, I've done this, this, and this, and this. I know that the MDM might not be the one applying, but at least make sure you can cross this. And should you have any problem, don't hesitate to contact us in the community. That's all for me. I think now is the time for Rebecca. Rebecca, floor or web is yours. Thank you, Jaime. So I'll just turn my camera on to say hello to everyone. Um, and so I'm just going to view a little bit of what we've done with the, the metadata packages to adapt some of these um, recommendations that have been made by the various product managers today. Um, and then also talk just a little bit about some of the implementation implementation strategies um, and how we can make the, the best out of these tracker and aggregate uh, data models. So, um, so I'll start with just kind of reviewing uh, the two main package resources that we have uh, for the COVID vaccine delivery use case. Um, so we do have um, the core aggregate package and as well as the electronic immunization registry tracker package. And so we actually designed these from the beginning, always thinking that um, components of these packages would likely be um, deployed together and also adapted and implemented within the country. Um, so some of this, in particular, the COVID vaccine, the core aggregate package, there is a component of this that allows for uh, daily reporting. Generally, this happens based on tally sheets of um, vaccines delivered through the many different sites in sort of a campaign style. And this was designed very much based on the successes in places like Bangladesh and Uganda, who had done this daily real-time monitoring at a, at a very large scale with campaign-style vaccine delivery uh, for measles rubella campaigns. So we felt pretty confident that this is, this is a design that should be able to work in a lot of different um, country contexts, uh, even when maybe the capacity and the infrastructure for being able to have your, your tracker on time and at national scale is perhaps still advancing. So if you can take me to the next slide, please. So the things that we did to uh, update this package, uh, we actually did a lot of things that um, Scott and that uh, Olav will also talk to you about a little bit later and Marcus in order to optimize the configuration. Um, some of those things are ad adapting the, um, definitions of the program indicators. So there is a program indicator file, for example, that you can download, look at it as a reference, or you could also install on top of an existing uh, modification and just kind of go in and look at those program indicators um, and make sure you have those comparisons. One of the biggest changes that we made um, in response to the um, analytics performance issues was to be able to include 
a dashboard that, that supports that really key use case around being able to monitor the daily progress of the campaign. And so in some countries where Tracker is really up to speed, um, they're able to really capture all of that individual level uh, electronic data almost uh, in real time. Um, sometimes the actual <laughs> analytics are having trouble keeping up. So what we have done here is actually we, we worked through this and realized that we can basically serve the same kinds of dashboards that are much, much lighter at much less risk of uh, crashing any large scale systems through the aggregate data model. And the way that we do that is by mapping these program indicators to a set of target uh, data elements. So uh, Olaf will tell you a little more about the other tools you can use to, to work out this approach for basically using um, a more performant daily monitoring dashboard that's being served by the aggregate data model, um, but it's actually consuming that underlying tracker data. And so the last piece is that um, there was quite a bit of just manual work that had to be done in order to map those program indicators uh, to the aggregate kind of dashboard. Um, so that work has somewhat been done for you and it's also contained within that program indicator file. Um, so even if you have a, a customization or adaptation of the tracker program, there are some components of this package that you can either use as a reference, uh, just look through the documentation to identify some of the key changes, try to apply those into your own configuration, or there's some components of these files that you can take that are really, they're non-breaking changes. Um, you can adopt these aggregate components into your system as well as updated program indicators. So next slide, please. Um, one of the really key issues we wanted to talk about is, um, you know, being able to assess uh, within your country context, if your tracker implementation, if it's really ready to be able to use this tracker data as the source for your real time monitoring data. Um, and just to give you, I mean, a lot of people really, they, they understand these uh, points. They're really not prescriptive. It's just to think about. Um, but if all of your vaccination sites are not equipped with an adequate number of usable up-to-date devices, do they have stable internet connectivity? Um, are there a sufficient number of trained data personnel across all of these sites? Um, if you don't have those items in place, it's going to be unlikely that you're going to be able to get all of that individual level data um, in real time. So you might need to start thinking about having some, some parallel processes. And this tends to happen in many countries. We're scaling up very quickly for uh, COVID-19 vaccines, but we generally know that large scale tracker programs, they can really take time for the human resources and the infrastructure to catch up. So please do have a plan. Um, you can be thinking about monitoring the lag time between uh, completeness of data between tally sheets and your uh, tracker registry to start assessing how ready uh, the country implementation is. And then also really thinking about some of those server hosting and monitoring functions. Are they really, are they well staffed? Um, do you have the human resources and knowledge um, and capacity that you need to, to keep making these real time tweaks? And if not, um, you know, that's okay. That's why DHIS2 has a really flexible data model. And we do think we have some opportunities to still achieve real time monitoring goals while you scale up the tracker system. Next slide, please. So I will close with just a couple uh, examples uh, to set up um, some of where Olav is going to share with you about the use of the aggregate data model alongside Tracker. So in this first scenario, we're kind of assuming that you're, you're in a country where trackers are uh, really functioning quite well at scale. And so a place like Sri Lanka that was mentioned earlier, uh, where nearly all of the um, population is captured as TEIs might be an example. So in this case, you might be taking the, the tracker program uh, some of that data really feeding your daily um, campaign monitoring indicators. We would just transform that tracker data into aggregate to be able to serve it to the users in a, in a more performant way. Um, but we also know that there's generally use of some aggregate data model as well in terms of being able to do some basic daily stock reporting from the sites, um, as well as just getting some target population data. Next slide, please. And the second scenario that uh, we wanted to remind you about, which is very, very common, is that there might be um, parallel reporting happening while that EIR tracker program scales up. And so in this scenario, um, you know, you might have your track tracker COVID IER sitting in a separate instance, um, and that might be happening at partial scale. Maybe it's covering some large urban centers, but not all of your rural geographies. Maybe the data entry is lagging by a few days, but that's probably okay. Um, you can still take advantage of doing SMS reminders, being able to generate certificates, um, being able to do data triangulation, but maybe that tracker data is not complete enough to use as your source for real-time monitoring. Um, in which case it's, it's equally um, 
feasible for vaccine sites to just submit those daily reports, those tally sheets um, in parallel and allow a lot of that analysis to happen more on the aggregate side. Um, it might reduce some of the issues that you would be having in terms of analytics performance on your tracker databases. Um, so with that, I do encourage you to um, look at some of the new resources that we've put up on the metadata package downloads page and, and really think about how um, you're ensuring that the, the DHIS2 design in country is um, appropriate for the level of um, infrastructure and operational resources available. So over to you, Olaf. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, so I'm Olaf, part of the implementation team in Oslo. Uh, I'll be talking uh, here at the end a little bit about this integration of tracker and aggregate uh, data models. Uh, so as Scott has uh, already covered, uh, we've seen that uh, using the program indicators in a lot of the dashboards analytics uh, is very heavy on these uh, large uh, scale instances. Um, and we've also seen that um, using the analytics on the same type of data uh, for aggregate data model uh, can be up to 100 times faster. Uh, so the idea with integrating the tracker and aggregate uh, data models is to be able to produce uh, key information for the users on their dashboards uh, in a way that is uh, less taxing on the server and uh, the application. Uh, so, as uh, we've already mentioned, this is about uh, taking those key program indicators you have in your tracker program and mapping them to aggregate data elements. Uh, then generating, for example, uh, uh, every day um, aggregate values uh, using those program indicators and saving them uh, as aggregate data elements, which you use then to display uh, on simple aggregate-based uh, dashboards. Uh, so, as many of you know, uh, there is no built-in support for doing this uh, sort of transformation from program indicators to aggregate data elements within DHIS itself. Uh, but what we do have is some guidance, which we have a link to there. It's in the implementation guidance of uh, our documentation site as well, uh, which explains the steps you need to go through if you want to develop some custom solution for moving this uh, data from tracker to aggregate. Um, but the interoperability team uh, is also working on some uh, scripts and tools uh, that you can use as a starting point for doing this kind of automated uh, transfer of data from tracker to aggregate. Uh, so that will be available uh, quite soon. We're doing some uh, testing now on the performance, uh, making sure that the uh, the accuracy of the data, what you're getting from the program indicators is what you're getting uh, through the aggregate data model, et cetera. Uh, so this, uh, this tool that the interoperability team is working on, uh, like I mentioned, it requires that you have some mapping between program indicators um, and the data elements. Um, in the metadata packages that we provide, this mapping is already done, as Rebecca mentioned. Um, Key thing to highlight here is perhaps that this tracker to aggregate is very linked, closely linked to the um, analytics processes in DHIS2. Uh, so doing this tracker to aggregate um, data transfer requires that the analytics scheduling uh, that you usually do uh, is turned off and the analytics generation becomes part of the tracker to aggregate process. So that you first generate your tracker analytics then you move your data from the program indicators into aggregate data values, and then you run the aggregate analytics. Um, so the script that the interoperability team uh, is working on, <laughs> the key thing there is that um, it breaks this task of transferring data, <clears throat> sorry, uh, into smaller tasks, uh, which is more scalable. Uh, so in the guidance we have, it explains how to extract, how to import the data. Uh, but when you reach the scale that many countries now do uh, in terms of the number of events, number of data values we have, um, this can't really be done as one operation to get all the tracker data out and put it all into the aggregate data model. Um, so the script uh, 
helps uh, break this uh, process down into smaller uh, smaller batches um, and it helps execute them in parallel to be more uh, efficient. Uh, so the team has a working version of this now, but they're still doing some tests and trying to uh, find the right parameters uh, to make this as fast and stable as possible. The last thing I wanted to end on here is just um, what Mike promised initially to say a bit about what uh, how we can support if you're starting to see performance issues. Um, and of course, the first is to look at the guidance that we've shared here now in the presentation and uh, that we've shared a link to a couple of times already. Um, and I really encourage you to look at this before you're starting to have problems. Do this as soon as you start thinking of um, implementing a large scale tracker um, uh, system. Start by looking at this uh, so that you're aware of all the potential issues and solutions. <clears throat> We've also made this small, small uh, self assessment or checklist, uh, which essentially is based on the guidance. Uh, the idea is to help you uh, sort of make sure tick off all the boxes that you've actually done all you can based on the guidance we have uh, to ensure good performance. Uh, and we also set up uh, an email address that you can reach um, the relevant people in the team here in Oslo uh, who can help with performance issues to help troubleshoot uh, and help advise if you're seeing, uh, if you're having issues with the performance. Uh, so I'll just encourage you to, even though you have the WhatsApp number or email address of individuals in the team, please use this email address if you're having performance issues uh, so that we can uh, coordinate how we support uh, countries and uh, ensure that what we learn in one, um, in one instance can be applied elsewhere. That's uh, what I wanted to cover. Uh, so I'll give the word back to uh, Mike here. Great, thank you, Ola. Um, so yes, we, we've uh, been handling a lot of uh, questions as they come in, either through the chat or that link to the community of practice. Um, so hopefully you're monitoring that and some of your questions there have been answered. Uh, one thing that I would say is to remember that this is meant to be very, very timely information. So some of the recommendations that we have, uh, for example, about uh, real-time analytics or about uh, using not using the random uh, uh, sequential for generating unique ideas, these are things that we know right now are not performing when they're at this very large scale. But that doesn't mean it will always be that way. We're also learning a lot from the implementations that come along and are slating uh, additions and improvements into for software development. So again, we're, we're planning and hoping to be very communicative with you all as a community and sending you information as things change and also as we identify other uh, challenges with performance. So we'll, we'll continue to share this information. We'll be updating the documentation that you've seen and we'll be of course releasing new patches and releases of DHS2, which will continue to contain improvements. But, but this information uh, we really wanted to get out to you all now, as we know that many programs are scaling or are slated to start scaling in the, the coming months.